भूरघुवह स्वह तुर्वरेण्यम वर्गो देवस् धीन ही धियो यो न प्रचोदया ओं शांति 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 नमस्कार माय डियर फ्रेंड्स कंटिन्यूइंग द description and explanation of the book Upadesa Saram of Bhagwan Sri Ram Naam Harisi Now I start with stanza number 9 remaining in the real being transcending all thought through intense devotion is the very essence of supreme bhakti <clears throat> bhakti faith or devotion thought involves a subject to think the object of thought and the thinking process perceived as three distinct factors known as the triputi the highest reach of abstraction gets beyond these three and beyond the two created soul and the creator into the one maharishi in this and the previous stanza is connecting the two bhakti and gyana that is devotion and illumination as they are seen to be the same at the end of one's course maharishi often says that bhakti is gyana and gyana is bhakti a truth clearly brought out by sankracharya's definition of bhakti svarupa anusandhanam bhakti ritta bhidiyate sva atam tatva anusandhane bhakti riyat pare jaguh this is from chudamani shloka number 32 and 33 which means concentration on the nature of the self is said to be bhakti by some others say it is concentration on the truth of the atma in these two stanzas maharishi shows how one who starts with devotion with a sense of difference between himself and god loses the difference in the intensity of his mood and arrives at non difference that is gyana and that is the essence of the highest devotion <clears throat> stanza number 10 absorption into the source or core of existence or the heart is what the path of karma bhakti yoga and gyan yoga teach this maxim is found in chapter up upanishad chapter number 3 and shloka number 14 i and brahma sutra 1 2 see footnote to page 14 and the four paths are not mutually exclusive stanza 1 to 9 deal with karma and bhakti 10 to 15 with yoga and 16 to 28 with gyana in shrimad bhagavat bhagavata only three paths are said to exist which gyana bhakti and karma yoga shreyo maya prokta nirnam shreyo vidhi satya gyanam kramcha bhaktischa no payo no sti kutrichita some go further and deny that the path of karma is anything more than a step to the other path be absorbed in the source the devotional mind of the bhakta is he find the personal god as the undoubted source of himself and of everything else and devotes to get wholly absorbed in him and thus he attains his goal <clears throat> the analytical introverted gyani with his strong leaning for metaphysics proceeds to enquire into the source and nature of himself and all other things in the universe and arriving at the ultimate real underlying both atma brahma 
seeks to realize himself as that that is to merge or lose his finite individuality in that the yogi with a practical bent of mind turn to the details of sadhana enabling the devotee or enquirer to concentrate on the personal god or the impersonal atma brahma and chalks out a course of self discipline the breathing exercises and other physical and mental steps that enable the mind to attain steadiness and absorption samadhi in god or atam brahma the votary of the path of karma also aims at the ultimate absorption and absorbs himself meanwhile in the performance of various acts that will take him to that goal all these paths prescribe the formula search and find the origin of yourself and be absorbed in that stanza 11 to 14 deal with absorption and 19 to 21 deal with the search for the source source this term denotes the ultimate real the brahma from which metaphysicians deduce the existence of everything the definition of the term brahma by varuna to explain it to his son bhrigu in order to enable him to discover it for himself with the help of such definition renders brahma is that whence all these creatures in the universe have issued that where upon they are sustained and that into which they return that is source stay and goal of the universe mostly this definition is regarded as indicating the impersonal absolute the real pure consciousness and that alone some regard it as applying to personal god some apply it to both after all these slide into each other for this term source maharishi uses the word hirda that is heart in his sanskrit version of this verse but that term is nowhere used in this tamil poem yet on account of its frequent use in religious especially mystic literature we shall briefly deal with deal it here harit or hirda is a sanskrit word having different senses and the transition from one sense to the other is obviously due to the belief in their identity or close connection the first sense of the word hirda is the organ known to physiology as the blood propeller <coughs> this was and even now is identified with the central and essential activities of human existence and was treated as the central source of nerves radiating there from to all parts of the body so another sense of the term heart or hirda is that which is the essence of a human existence that is the atma brahma the ultimate and only real of advaitic metaphysics thus the term has one use in physiology and another in metaphysics various thinkers and mystics have had a variety of experiences in their efforts to realize the bliss of merging themselves in the ultimate real for their mystic purposes they fixed and do st- still fix their attention on some spot in their just as the ultimate or temporary resting place of their ego they have recorded their experiences that are like in deep sleep and samadhi the jiva or empirical ego was felt to sink into the central spot of the chest which they term the heart it is further explained deep sleep and samadhi strongly resemble each other in a very important particular that is disappearance entire or practically entire of the ego consciousness with the, the consequent blissful feeling of repose in brihad arnaya ka upanishad 
they are described in the same or almost the same phrases passages to 17 to 9 say that indeed sleep the jiva previously full of conscious activity passes along with prana life sight hearing and mind into the 72000 nerves which pass from the heart and its pericardium and connect them with all parts of the body and through those nerves into the ether of the heart and bliss blissfully rest there like a boy or a monarch or a mahabrahma chapter upanishad 863 refer to the resting of the jiva during deep sleep in those nerves that is really in the heart to which they lead see the upanishad 16 katha upanishad chapter 6 stanza uh, uh, shloka number 17 chapter 4 uh, and shloka number 12 and 6 chapter 3 shloka 12 mundagnu upanishad chapter 3 and shloka 5 among numerous texts describe brahma as residing in the ether of heart or in the cave or in the body generally in many treaties <coughs> it is stated that jiva resides in the waking state in the brain and proceeds to the heart in deep sleep and joins with brahma there in smadhi bhagavad gita chapter 8 uh, shloka number 12 10 and 13 chapter 10 shloka 20 chapter 13 shloka 31 and 33 chapter 15 shloka number 14 and 15 chapter 16 shloka 18 chapter 17 shloka 6 and chapter 18 shloka 61 the bible Excelsia chapter 10 verse 2 states that a wise man's heart is at his right hand but a fool's heart at his left empirical ego was felt to sink into the central spot of the chest which they termed the heart Stanza number 11 as birds are caught with the net so by holding the breath the mind is restrained and absorbed this breath regulation is a device for effective of absorption for the explanation the sufi mystics says mr susastri in his recent islamic culture Volume 2, page 474, are agreed in their view that kalab or hearts are the three: one physical on the left side, another called the animal soul on the right side, and a third between the two, praised by Sufis as a spiritual faculty, a kind of mirror in which the supreme will is reflected. It is by keeping this heart pure from worldly attachment that a human being can approach the Creator. The real knowledge is God's illumination of this heart. The divine revelation to the prophet is impressed on this heart, as is said in the Quran. The faithful spirit, that is divine messenger, has descended with it. revelation upon your heart that you may be of warner chapter 26 uh, stanzas 193 to 194 the hindu shastras do not assign any place to the source of illumination yoga vasishta says that there are two hearts one the gross which may be ignored by the seeker after illumination and the second the brahma which is taken by the jiva for the mystic purpose of realizing itself by contemplation 
as the blissful real as both inside and outside and neither inside nor outside the human body that is which may be taken to be either non spatial or pervasive of all space or residing at any particular spot see upasana prakarna chapter 78 stanza 32 to 37 Maharishi's experience has been repeatedly stated by him <clears throat> is that is the ego is felt to sink into right side of the chest with something like a jerk when samadhi begins and to reemerge from there at the cessation of samadhi with a similar jerk undue importance should not be attached to this location of the heart or the variation therein each group follow following its own variation derive its usual and expected benefit the heart as signifying brahma is the only matter of importance and that though unconnected with the space or the body is reached through mystic sadhana of some sort or other locating the mind or self in particular parts of the body pranayama breath regulation is a means and only one of the means adopted to secure a temporary lull in the mind's activity stanza number 12 <clears throat> for mind and life prana expressed in thought and action diverge and branch but they spring from a single root this verse explains how breath regulation controls the mind Stanza number 13 absorption has two forms which laya and nasa that which is merely absorbed in laya revives if dead it revives not notes laya is temporary absorption nasa is permanent the absorption described in the 11th stanza is temporary the spiritual aspirant cannot rest content with that he must proceed to mano nasa the permanent absorption described in the 14th and 15th verses mano nasa that is literally death of the mind does not really mean becoming insentient mano nasa means the loss of the present form of the mind with its narrow obstructed and distorted vision preventing a person from seeing himself to be really the atma and causing him to identify himself with the body more or less completely the loss of that form is really again as it means the transformation of the finite and distorting mind into pure consciousness perfect reality that is atma or brahma embracing everything and leaving nothing outside itself <coughs> if the term consciousness in pure consciousness is taken as necessarily implying the existence of mind in some form then it may be correct to say that in the entire course from the noviciate to the state of realization a person is never without a mind <clears throat> in fact we find in religious literature expressions referring to the mind of a gyani or jivan mukta great saints themselves have given us personal hints on this matter that are of great value they refer to their enjoyment of bliss in the satya chit ananda state and declare it to be ineffable Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa explained that the mind in that state was like a thin line drawn on water having a fugitive existence or like a rope burned to ashes such a rope retains the form and appearance of a rope but one cannot bind anything with it such a mind is described as <coughs> shuddha sattva even this perhaps requires a slight modification in view of the gita statement that there is nothing in existence without the admixture of the three gunas the description of the saint's mind as in 
Shuddha Sattva is right because there in the Sattvic element preponderates so overwhelmingly over the other elements as to drown them or blot them out of view, if not out of existence. The saint is so gentle, saral, so sattvic, his will is surrendered. He has no attachment or desire and his <coughs> deeds do not produce any vasana or bondage like those of worldly persons. There is a doctrine of substantial compliance in spirituality as in law. Neither religion nor law takes note of trifles. Even in physical science, what is substantially a vacuum, for example, that obtained by an air pump is treated as a vacuum and is found for all practical purposes to be a vacuum. This parallel may well be used in understanding the term sattvic mind of the jivan mukta and also perhaps is the phrase the jiva that without suffering extinction transcends personality. <coughs> Stanza number 14. When the mind can get absorbed by breath restraint, then it will die, that is, its form will perish. It fixed to a single point. The aspirant should not be content with pranayama, breath regulation, which stills the mind only so long as the breath is held. He should proceed to kill it. That is done by unflinching perseverance in concentration on the supreme. Death of the mind or even its temporary absorption is termed samadhi. The highest form of it is the permanent merger or union of the individual in Brahma. All other forms are inferior. There is, however, a gradation among them. Suska, that is barren samadhi and jada samadhi are terms applied to certain types of voluntary trance or stupefaction of the senses and the mind produced by psychophysiological or spiritual gymnastics in which, however, Atma, Brahma, or Satyachit Ananda is neither realized nor approached. Even this, if properly utilized, may be a good preparation for real and even the highest Samadhi. Absorption of the mind is a fine art, but its value depends on what one is absorbed in. Absorption in a mathematical problem in music or in love has its value for the joy that it gives and for the preparation it affords for absorption in the Supreme. Absorption in one's East Devta or personal God achieved mostly with the aid of image or other symbols such as light and fire is really absorption in love, a refined or sublimated love, and is the next higher step that is termed second. <coughs> Savikalpa Samadhi. So long as the mind perceives the things other than itself, it is having vikalpas or differentiating process. When these are narrowed down to a very few objects, for example, one's god with some attributes or his symbol, it is Savikalpa Samadhi. Many devotees are enjoying this in the course of their worship or <clears throat> of their devotional exercises. Every highly intense devotion, however, leads one to lose his individuality in one's God. Then it becomes nirvikalpa samadhi, one shoreless sea of undifferentiated consciousness which, which it is impossible to describe. We can only try to hint at the by saying that there 
one's self has become god that the personal god has easily passed into his essential nature that is termed impersonal brahma and that the feeling at its threshold is that all differences appear merely to be consumed and absorbed in unity or do not appear at all when glimpses of such realization are caught and enjoyed for a time and there is a return to the previous or preparatory state or stage these glimpses are termed kevala nirvikalpa samadhi they are the vasanas of the individual though subdued for the time being are still alive and they drag him back into the lower stages and will continue to do so till they are thoroughly and completely extinguished after the exhaustion uh, exhaustion of vasanas the individual is in the sahaja nirvikalpa samadhi he is in permanent realization of the self or brahma tan maya nishtha and there is no return from that state what people call his body will remain living and active with its senses and intellect till the course of action for which that body came into existence prarabdha is over but this is the view of the onlooker the realizer does not any more identify himself with that body or its activity and feels no attachment or concern with its activity or in activity or the attendant pleasure or pain this is what the next verse states verse number 15 the great yogi whose mind is extinguished and who rest in brahma has no karma as he has attained his true nature brahma bhagavad gita chapter 3 verse number 17 18 brihadarne kupanishad chapter 4 and verse 12 he feels no need or desire for karma when it is performed he does not feel that he is the actor the results do not affect him so it is said that he has no karma the bondage of karma does not affect its creator god personal or impersonal nor the self realizer in his tanmaya nishtha state of realization gods and <coughs> jivan mukta acts may seem to be like worldly persons acts but are really sui generis and produce no such results nor do they recoil that is the first act of creation subsequent acts of creation and incarnations avatars are not the result of any previous karma or vasana nor do they produce any phala or vasana affecting the freedom of god bhagavad gita chapter 4 uh, verse number 6 13 and 24 chapter number 9 uh, 24 C appendix C the saint who has entirely surrendered his will to the supreme say i not i but the supreme in me or in the words of bhagavad gita chapter 5 verse 7 to 14 he lies secure and happy within yet aloof from the body quiet unmoved and touched by its vasanas and consequent activities realizing that he is not the agent such a saint is referred to here as one that has lost his ego or mind and has escaped mukta karmic bonds the next and following verses proceed to show him the wise escape such bondages <clears throat> where any activity produces beyond the immediately intendedly result ulterior results over mastering the agent's will that is transforming him and subjecting him to unintended and desired fruits and penalties <coughs> penalties entailing involuntary rebirth it is termed as bondage desire is its cause so i end the video here and we'll continue next video with the strange of 16 onward 
थैंक यू माई डियर फ्रेंड्स फॉर लिसनिंग दिस वीडियो वॉचिंग एंड लिसनिंग दिस वीडियो विद पेशेंस थैंक यू सो मच प्लीज लाइक कॉमेंट एंड शेयर द वीडियो एंड सब्सक्राइब माई चैनल नमस्ते माई डियर फ्रेंड्स नमस्ते